All right, I hope I'm audible to the people who are online because someone had written that they cannot hear. So hopefully everyone can hear. All right, just to address another question which Vijay had raised. He's not in the class, right? Okay. okay, but he's full of doubts. So yes, uh, you know, just to touch upon something that uh, Vijay has asked over here. Um, he said, what about people who do not get to hear the gospel? Uh, what about them? So what happens to their salvation? And um, we have a few scriptures which kind of touch upon this concept. Uh, so we have Romans chapter 1. Again, these are things which have been repeated again and again. So we are kind of already familiar with these uh, concepts. So just to very quickly go over that, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 onwards, where it says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against people you know, who are being ungodly and wicked. And so because of their ungodliness and wickedness, these people, they are, it says over here, they are suppressing the truth. So there are people who actually would prefer not to know the truth. Okay, so they would prefer to continue in their wickedness. They would prefer to continue in their ungodliness. And so they, there's no real desire inside them to know the truth. So such people, they tend to suppress the truth. On the other hand, if they had an open attitude, if they really had a hunger in their heart to know the actual real truth, then they would begin to see what is there in creation. And it talks about how ever since the creation of the world, um, God's eternal power and divine nature are being seen. So they would begin to sense in their heart that this is the correct thing. And you know that th this is the wrong thing. They would begin to sense all of those things. First of all, if they have an openness to know the truth, but the, uh, but a whole bunch of people are actually not even interested in knowing the truth. So what about some you know um, person living in some remote tribe on some remote island uh, where no missionary has gone with the gospel? Even the people sitting over there, God has put you know his. Um, is uh, you know written uh, word in their hearts of course they will not have their logos but at least they have something imprinted in their hearts which makes them aware that there is a greater truth and so uh, people who are genuinely interested will make an attempt to start finding out what is the truth they may not have a missionary to walk up to and say kindly tell me what you believe is the truth but at least they will begin to sense in their heart and in their own way they will begin to search for it and so when that happens you know in scripture it very clearly explains that god is always open to people who are searching sincerely for the truth he will find some way of revealing himself to them uh, we find that in first chronicles chapter 28 verse 9 uh, where it says uh, you know, in the last portion of uh, First Chronicles 28, verse 9, it says, If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will abandon you forever. Over here, of course, the immediate context is Solomon and God speaking to Solomon. But the general, general principle contained over there in, in those words is applies to all humans. If you have a desire to really know the truth and you're trying to seek out the true God, the true God will be found by you. You can have, you know, so that person out there in that remote tribe, you know, in the on that remote island may not uh, get to know all the doctrinal details of systematic theology, but that person will at least know enough to make a commitment to this living God that they are beginning to have a conversation with in their heart because the Holy Spirit works even in those islands where, uh, you know, missionaries have not yet gone. Um, in the same way, a very familiar scripture would be Hebrews 11. Where it verse six, where it says, "Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach Him must believe that He exists." So, anyone who really wants to know the truth will look at creation and begin to see His divine nature. In that, they will begin to realize that He very much exists, and they will begin to search sincerely, trying to find out who is this real God. And when they do that, it says He rewards those who seek Him. So. Yes, even people who may not have a full knowledge of the, you know, of the gospel the way we do, God reaches out to them at their level, um, you know, uh, so no one has to fear that, 
you know that they are beyond uh, hope if they have that genuine desire in their heart if they have because the holy spirit is continuing his work of conviction throughout the entire world okay so uh, in in his own way he will reach out to all true seekers the ones who are genuinely seeking after him he will begin to reveal himself to them coming back to what we were uh, discussing earlier um titus 3 5 we saw how jesus saves people he does it uh, 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 through the washing of rebirth and through the renewal by the holy spirit so this is basically explained to us in romans chapter 6 verse 6 hopefully by now you're completely by heart with that whole concept uh, so when the when the baby is born it is born with a spiritually dead spirit we are all born with spiritually dead spirits but then in that moment of salvation when we are submitting to the jesus and saying i believe in you i believe my salvation is through you alone in that moment when we make that commitment i uh, be you know romans 6 6 explains that old self that spiritually dead spirit which is inside us it gets crucified with him so that person is basically is killed crucified dead that person is thrown out that person no longer is there inside that human container what is now placed inside that human container inside that human body is a brand new god created spirit um okay so um we see that explained further in romans chapter 6 verse 4 uh, you know um, which is how the whole conversation begins in romans uh, you know paul starts off by telling that and then he goes on to explain what he means so romans chapter 6 verse 4 if we could read out romans chapter 6 verse 4 therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as christ was raised from the dead by the by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life Okay, so over here he's talking about what happened in the spiritual realm in that moment when that person placed their faith in jesus in the spiritual realm there's a burial that's happening a person dies the person is crucified the person dies with jesus and just the same way jesus christ is raised now a new brand new person who has been birthed by the holy spirit is raised into the kingdom of god and so now they choose to live in a new way and uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it, it again repeats that same idea. It says, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here, is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. And so in Galatians, in fact, in the last chapter, uh, Paul talks about himself as the new creation. He says it's not important whether you get circumcised or don't get circumcised. All that is doesn't make a difference. What actually matters is whether or not you are a new creation is what he says so all of these scriptures confirm the fact that there are some people who are actually born again only such people are actually true believers okay so regeneration this rebirth this new person being created on the inside is a basic fundamental step uh, which is required for salvation on the, on the inside of a person, if you're still having that same spiritually dead spirit with which you were born, then you are, how much ever you may follow Christian rituals on the outside, on the inside, you still have not become a child of God. You are still a part of the world and you're still under condemnation. So uh, it is so essential to understand what salvation is. So when we come in true repentance and we come with a faith in Jesus, which is not just intellectual, but a faith which is, uh, real in the sense you submit entirely to him when you do that this regeneration this rebirthing process takes place inside the person and now they become part of the kingdom of god so because you see in that moment now you have become united with christ you are now in union with jesus christ and amazing things start happening once you are attached to the wine now this branch which was nowhere, you know, which is like, you know, lying over there on the roadside, ready to be thrown into the fire, has now got attached, it has got grafted into the 
olive tree into the wine all these biblical images which are there in your new testament so now this person is now attached to christ they are in union with christ and now a new journey begins because now he you know without that now that they have taken up their yoke and they are willing to learn from him he is not going to start doing wonderful things in their lives okay so their life is never going to be the same again uh, so in that's why it says in second corinthians 5:17 you know it says if anyone is in christ then the new creation has come so in that moment when that new creation is formed that person is now in christ they are united with christ um and uh, this is one lovely example which one person has used you know to talk about this union with christ he talks about a bucket of water and he talks about a sponge uh, so when you take the sponge and you put it inside that bucket of water uh, what happens that sponge it absorbs all the water right uh, and uh, so even as it absorbs the water um it uh you know it's like as if it's become part of the water the sponge is still sponge the water is still water they're two separate things the sponge has not become water but the sponge is now absorbing the water so they talk about jesus christ you know like he is that bucket of water and the, be the believer who has now chosen to you know um be in christ he's like the sponge which has now been submerged in the water so he begins to absorb jesus he becomes more and more like jesus so the more he allows himself to be immersed in christ the more he absorbs of christ becomes like him this is just an example but you know it kind of gives us an idea so wherever this bucket of water goes the sponge also goes so all the experiences which the bucket of water has the sponge also begins to experience all of those same things so you get it when jesus christ was you know uh, crucified you also spiritually in the spiritual realm you also underwent a crucifixion process when jesus christ was buried in that tomb in the same way now that you have become a believer you too went through that burial which you know we act out in water baptism but the water baptism is just a physical ceremony but in the spiritual realm you also were buried and then when jesus christ rose up resurrected you also rose up but now you rose up as a new creation no long, longer are you the person that you were born you know on your birthday that that spiritually dead uh, spirit has been crucified done away with now you are a new creation so whatever that bucket of water you know experiences of the bucket of water has gone through the sponge now goes through the same experiences so at some spiritual level you are in fact getting united with christ in through all, in all of his experiences which is why paul you know he says he says i want to uh, i want to uh, experience everything that christ has experienced i want to share in his sufferings why because he got the concept he understood that he is the sponge and he is immersing himself more and more in christ and even as he does that he is going to experience everything that christ experienced and in the process he is going to become like christ he clearly understood why he first of all got salvation to become this to enjoy this to have this union with christ and literally become more and more like him so if you know you and i just stay as believers who say oh wow now finally i'm saved and then you sit back and do nothing you're not growing into the things that you were meant to you were meant to be that sponge which is absorbing more and more which is literally experiencing the things which christ experienced so the sufferings of christ is what you and i actually go through you know when we go through different experiences where you know people are uh, you know hurtful towards us uh, where we have to sacrifice something and and do something which honors god all these are exp experiences which christ went through and now in your union with him you are also choosing to participate in all of that and he helps you to do it all in a godly manner and even as you're doing it without even realizing it you're becoming more and more like christ i wonder when the angels look at us can they see how much to what extent we have become christ like can they see that i don't know but it's interesting because you see there are some people who have not done any work of 
uniting themselves with the lord and so they're still the way they were unrenewed mind still under the you know uh, urges of the physical container that they are living in even though they have become a brand new spirit they are not really done anything about it but on the other hand there are people who are so eager they're absorbing jesus day and by day day in day out they're saying lord i want to be with you participate with you in all that you participated in and they are becoming like him which is what was the ultimate goal of salvation that a person should become like jesus their savior you know so that is the actual ultimate goal of salvation uh, so this union with christ is involved in basically involves two things where you you know are uh, symbolically not symbolically spiritually you are on the cross with christ you are with him in the tomb you were buried and when you came out you came out as a new creation in the same way jesus was uh, rose up you know resurrected in a glorified body now that has not happened to us it will be will experience that when the glorification takes place in the end times uh, but uh, right now uh, we at least have a renewed spirit so that is why it says over here in romans chap uh, chapter 6 verses 3 to 4 you know which we looked at just now it says over there um so we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father we too may live a new life so this new life which we are living how are we living it colossians chapter 3 verses 1 to 4 this is the second aspect of you know being united with christ colossians chapter 3 um verses 1 to 4 if then you were raised with christ seek those things which are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on things on the earth for you died and your life is hidden with christ in god when christ when fourth also mm. when christ who is our life appears then you also will appear with him in glory yeah so you see now your life is hidden at least it's supposed to be you know we sometimes act like as if our life is not hidden with christ but that is basically what we are supposed to be now we are hidden in that bucket of water we are immersed in it whatever the bucket has gone through we should be going through the same thing so we are our lives are meant to be hidden in christ and when we live in this way you know christ who is our life when he appears it says you also will appear with him in glory so currently our current position is that we are seated with him in the spiritual realm so whatever he is we are supposed to be in the authority that he exercises we we exercise the way the same attitude he had towards sin and temptation that should be our attitude so uh, we our life is supposed to stay hidden in him i know we are, we should be constantly think of ourselves as that sponge and we should remain in the bucket of water we should abide in him we must stay connected to the vine or no different images that you can use to talk about the same thing um so if we are really living like that hidden in christ seated with him in the spiritual in, you know in, in the heavenly realms if we are doing that really we don't have to worry about what happens to this physical container even if somebody tries to harm this physical body that you are in nobody can touch who you are you are you are the one who is seated in the heavenly realm with him you are safe and secure in him no powers of hell no powers on earth nothing can separate you from the love of god you are united with him one with him he will carry out the purposes for your life whatever needs to be done he will accomplish in his own time in his own way no one can touch you you are seated with him it's only your physical container which is out here they may attack it they may harm it but you yourself you and your the purposes for your life are secure in him nothing can separate you from the love of god so those are the amazing realities of being united with jesus christ okay so um and of course we know the practical aspect of the union with christ you know john john 15:4 it says no branch can bear fruit by itself so neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me so we make a conscious choice to stay in him 
and the danger of not doing that is also mentioned in John 15, 6, where it says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Okay, so um, that is uh, the warning which is given to people who don't want to be like the sponge. They don't want to be in the bucket. They think life is too tough inside the bucket and they want to live separately. Um, so uh, that would be a dangerous way to live because you may reach a point where now you have become so hardened and deadened uh, you know, on the inside that you cross the point where you can repent. Uh, now, um, this, I don't know, I just take all these multiple classes and I cannot remember what I shared in which class. So I hope that this is not a repetition. Did I talk about the Philippians example of the man who, you know, OK, I think I have not. Uh, so um, there's this person uh, who goes to Philip Yancey, who's a famous writer. And he says, you know, there's this uh, person that he wants to have an affair with, an extramarital affair he wants to have with that person. So he says, I want to do it. And God is loving. So uh, I'll do it. And then I'll come back to him. And I'll seek forgiveness. God will forgive. And from then on, I'll be very, very sincere to the Lord, is what the man says. So Philip Yancey says to him, Yes, but when you come back to him, what if you discover that you have crossed the point of being able to repent? You see, you've reached that point where there's no longer any shame or regret for your sin. You reach that point where there's no longer a desire to be his follower, to, to, to crucify the flesh on a daily basis. What, you have, what if you have reached that point where there's nothing left on the inside? You still want that ticket to heaven. But that ability to reach out and say, Lord, please have mercy on me, a sinner, you've crossed that point. You no longer feel that urgency. You no longer feel that, what if you have reached that point? That must have made the man think. So you see, you can't just go on living in sin and saying, nothing will happen to me. Yes, it says in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, you, you will reach a point where it is impossible for you to repent so we should never reach that point you know so uh yeah uh regarding uh to what you have shared an example but uh, there will be some uh people uh who uh when uh people were going like this or uh, there will be people who are telling like it's okay god has already paid praise for you he already forgive you because they quote quotations uh, they like tell that uh your your faith is so much more than your sin because uh, before the foundations of the world uh, lamb lamb has been slain even before you have sinned god has forgiven you then how we can uh, know yeah so before the foundations of the world the lamb was slain the prepared salvation um, um, the the way to salvation was already prepared already you know, put in place. So anyone who comes to him with a repentant attitude, anyone who accepts that invitation in the appropriate manner and is willing to wear the wedding garments, maybe anyone who goes through all that process, yes, God is available for them. And so they step into the salvation experience. But after having received the salvation experience, they would also need to be aware that Hebrews chapter 6 exists. So after having experienced all this, if they choose not if they say i don't want to be under the covering of jesus christ anymore that's their free will you know that's their choice so that um huh. God has paid so as long as you stay under christ all that christ has for in his covenant is yours but if you say, no, I don't want to be under the covenant, I'd rather go and be out on my own because I love this world, then yes, you're now on your own. You're no longer under whatever Christ has offered freely, generously. All he's saying is, you place your faith in me. I will, through the Holy Spirit, help you to live this new way of life. But if you say, no, I don't want to take up your yoke, Lord. I don't want to learn from you. It's a free choice and it happens extremely rarely to very, very few people because the Holy Spirit does not give up on his family. He continues pursuing to the limit. But if a person is so determined and they choose to just close their ears and not hear, if they choose to be deaf, 
they can reach a point at least theoretically now whether it actually happens to believers or not we do not know but the possibility is mentioned very clearly in the scripture so nobody should uh, be that careless or reckless about what has been freely given to them okay so uh, moving on very quickly to the whole concept of justification so justification is basically where um, you know god declares a person as righteous so god looks at that person in that moment of salvation and god forgives all of their past sins all the sins which they are currently indulging in and even all the sins which they will be committing in the future as believers he forgives all of those sins because he's not looking at that person but rather he's looking at the sacrifice which jesus christ did that person is now placing themselves under the atoning sacrifice of jesus christ so G so god the father looks at the atoning sacrifice looks at this person who has placed themselves under the covering of the atoning sacrifice and he says all right they are atoned they are forgiven so he that is the stand legal stand which uh, god takes towards that person uh, so again over here uh, you know we have the same two things operating the grace of god so this justification is given to us freely by the grace of god and we receive it because we have chosen to place our faith in jesus so that would be romans chapter 3 verse 24 if someone can read out romans 3 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus yeah so all are you know justified freely by his grace so this justification where god declares god is like you know that the supreme judge who is sitting and he declares and says all right this person is now declared righteous which basically means all their sins have been forgiven so that is given freely by god's grace and whom is it given to romans 4 3 where it says abraham believed god and it was credited to him as righteousness so who receives this justification who receives this uh, this righteousness anyone and everyone who chooses to place their faith in jesus christ so uh, just you know to address the question which has been mentioned over here uh, by vijay uh, i told you right this guy is not in the class but his mind is full of questions good student he's paying full attention yeah. so yeah um, and there are some in the class who are sitting here but they're not even here so but i mean that's a different matter um so uh, yeah vijay talks about the thief on the cross and he says this person um he repented of who he was but he didn't get regenerated now, how can we say that this man placed his faith in Jesus while everyone else was mocking Jesus and saying, ha, look at this Jesus. He can't even get down from the cross. He says that he's divine. He says that God has sent him and God has not come and rescued him. Look, he's still hanging over there. While all the people were mocking, this thief placed his faith in Jesus, believed that he is God. And he said, when you come into your kingdom, because you really are God and this kingdom, which you have been talking about is really there. I want to be part of it. So when you come into your kingdom, please remember me also. The man, he has repented and he has placed his faith in Jesus. So obviously he would have got regenerated. Uh, well, the regeneration for him would have happened after the crucifixion. Of, you know and resurrection of jesus so he would have gone into paradise to join all those people who are still waiting to enter into heaven you know he would have gone and joined hands with abraham and all the others moses and all the others who are still waiting so he would have gone into paradise and then after jesus finishes his resurrection he goes to paradise collects all of them takes them to heaven uh, that again would be an entirely you know lengthy topic so let's not even go there but yeah this man he placed his faith in jesus and he repented so he definitely uh, had the salvation experience coming back to our justification uh, you know some people uh, raise the question so if a person uh, person's sins have been forgiven they have been justified um, so their past sins present sins at the moment of salvation and even their future sins if all of those sins are forgiven 
then does that mean that now that person will never lose their salvation? No, we just kind of talked about that, right? Uh, so um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, 2 Corinthians 5.21, no, in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God who had not, Jesus who had not committed any sin, he became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we become the righteousness of God because all our sins have been forgiven. Romans 3.22, the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So it's only the people who believe who will receive this righteousness. Now for all of such people, it says in Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation anymore for these people who have placed their faith in Jesus and been given the righteousness of God? Why is there no condemnation anymore? Because all of their sins have been forgiven, including even the future sins so every time the believer sins he doesn't lose his salvation let's say that tomorrow i tell a lie may the lord forbid that i tell a lie but you know if i tell a lie tomorrow um, that's it will it'll not mean that i'm going to lose my salvation tomorrow why because even that sin which is going to be committed tomorrow has already been forgiven otherwise you see we'll constantly be one minute saved one, one minute not saved that's not the way. That's not what scripture says. So every time you commit a sin, you don't lose salvation. Why? Because when you were declared as uh, justified, the reason you were declared justified is because all of your sins were forgiven. If only when 50% of the sins were forgiven, how would Jesus, how would the supreme judge declare you as justified? He would be making a false judgment. The reason that you were declared as justified is because now he who had known no sin became sin for us. And, and in exchange, he took all our sins upon him. In exchange, he gave us his righteousness. And that is the only reason why the Supreme Judge, God, the Father, declared and said, yes, this person is now righteous. So every five minutes, you don't lose your salvation. It does not work that way. Because there's another implication. If you're going to be losing your salvation every five minutes, Jesus Christ, you know, you can't just simply, yeah, you can't just simply say, you know, okay, you're forgiven. A penalty has to be paid for that sin. So Jesus Christ would literally have to come down again, get crucified, again, go back, again, come down. And it's just, it's not what the Bible talks about. Bible says in Hebrews 10, 10, and by that will, you know, that's God's will to save us. By that will, we have been made holy. How have we been made holy? Through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He came, he did his sacrifice once for all. When you are united with him, you become that sponge inside the bucket. At that moment, you are, you know, have been Forgiven once for all. Now, this person who has experienced this, they are supposed to continue in that, you know, uh, uh, in that uh, attitude of forgiven, of being forgiven and of being a new creation who can live in victory over sin. So uh, what about 1 John 1, 8 to 9? You know, someone can read out that very, very familiar passage. 1 John 1, 8 to 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So believers should not say, oh, now I'm incapable of sin. I will never ever sin. And if something which I'm doing looks like sin, I can't say, no, 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 I'm, this is not a sin because now I'm a believer. A believer cannot sin. So in 1 John, very clearly, John is clarifying in this letter and telling the believers, stop thinking about this wrong heresy. This is a wrong doctrine. It does not say in the scriptures that believers will never ever sin. Believers also sin because they are still learning to become like Christ. They have not completely become like Christ yet. They are in the process of learning 
to do that. They are in the process of learning to trust him more and more, submit to him more and more, abide in the wine more and more. This is the process that you're still developing and growing into. So stop telling yourselves that you are beyond sin is what John says over here. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. But he says, if we confess our sins, and if we honestly admit and say, Lord, what I have done is sinful, then God is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us. So why, why is God being faithful and why is he being just? It's because he knows that the atoning sacrifice has been done for even these sins. And therefore, he says, you are forgiven. Why? Because the forgiveness has already been, you know, um, covered by Jesus' atoning sacrifice. Uh, so which is why, you know, he, he explains this. He talks about this in 1 John 1, 8 to 9. And he continues the argument into chapter 2. So in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, if someone could read out. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. My little children... These things I write to you that you may not sin. Mm. And if anyone sins, we have an adv advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Mm. And he himself is the propitiation prop for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So because of this atoning sacrifice that Jesus Christ has done, uh, because of that, uh, you know, our sins are forgiven and therefore God is just and faithful when he says, all right, you are forgiven of this thing which you have done. So at the moment of salvation, all sins already stand forgiven. But each time we actually commit a sinful act, we have to again go back to him and say, Lord, what I have done is sinful. I admit it and Lord, I repent of it. I do not want to repeat it again. And then the Lord says, yes, you are forgiven because he is just and faithful. And he remembers how he already chose to forgive you at the moment of salvation because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. So, um, yeah. Mm. Mm. So it's only up. Uh, so Hebrews chapter um, six and Hebrews ten are applying to people who are not able to come and make this confession and repent. They've crossed that point. They can say the words, of course, like the Pharisee who went to the, uh, to the temple and said, "Oh Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like these other people." All the words can come out of your mouth, but are you in a position to be able to actually feel ashamed of what you have done and say, "I no longer want to do this. I choose to follow you." Hebrews 6 is talking about people who have crossed the point where there's any desire left inside them to even want to repent. They cannot. They have crossed the point of being able to. Here it's not talking about such believers. It will differ from person to person. Nobody knows, only the Lord knows, uh, because he's the one who constantly looks at the heart. So we are people who fail again and again. And every time we go back to him and we say, Lord, I really do not want to do this anymore. He looks at our heart. He sees whether there's genuine repentance over there. And every time there is repentance, he is able to forgive. There's no such thing as Jesus cannot forgive. He's always able to forgive. But are you always able to reach, to be able to come go to him genuinely? A person may reach a stage where they can no longer go to him with genuineness. They can say all the right words. They can, they can shed tears. They can get down on their knees. But on the inside, they've crossed the point where there's any desire left to remain in the kingdom of God. It's only talking about those people. So, uh, yeah, so the justification, um, salvation, regeneration, everything is, uh, is for the person who has placed themselves under Jesus. 
But if that person says, I no longer wish to be under Jesus, as long as you're under Jesus, you're under his covering. Everything that he has done for you applies to you. You are the sponge in the bucket. But if you say, I no longer wish to be over here and you walk away permanently and only God knows when that moment becomes permanent, where, where there is no longer any, uh, no coming back for you. Only the Lord who knows each person's heart will know that you have reached that point. So we on the outset cannot judge anyone and say oh, they have crossed the point of return. No, we can never say that because who knows, deep down that person may still be in a position uh, to you know respond and repent one day. We do not know, but the Lord knows, the one who, who looks at all hearts, he will know at which point Hebrews 6 will apply to you because he's talking about such people. He says those who have tasted and uh, in uh, and still you know gone into sin, they are now it is impossible for them to repent. Whom is he talking about? Only he knows that we will not be able to you know determine from our side. So we would not even have to worry about those things if we never allow ourselves to deteriorate to that extent. We will not even go anywhere near that point. So See, all I can say is what is there. It's written over there in scripture. But Jesus does not explain and give a list of names. So they're saying these are the people who have crossed that point. So, I mean, how would we be able to tell? So, so. Okay, in the example that I used, the person says, I want to sin, so I will do it. And I'll go back to him and I will, uh, you know, uh, ask for forgiveness. So forgiveness is given to everyone who repents. What is repentance? Repentance is genuine godly sorrow saying, I wish I had not done this and I will never do it again. So what if the person has crossed the point where there's no more desire inside them to, to follow him? What if that person has become so hardened that they cannot follow him anymore because they have chosen to be that uh, to be that deadened on the inside? They chose to close their ears to the Holy Spirit to that extent. It's it's something between God and them. So which is why I'm saying maybe Hebrews chapter six does not even actually happen to believers, but the chance of it, uh, the possibility of it, is given as a warning, by, because the Holy Spirit never allows anyone to just simply go their own way he pursues them as a loving god so but if a person wishes to it is possible okay so um, we would have to leave it at that because we can never tell that this is the exact point where a person steps you know crosses the point where they no longer feel a desire to repent how would we know we have no idea we only the one who said use, use the words over there which say impossible for that person to repent only he knows when that point is reached. Um, yeah. yeah when jesus used the example of the narrow path and the broad path the narrow road and the broad path um he was talking about how it's so easy to follow the world which has got easy ways of attaining salvation so they all go down this path where each one decides okay i'll, I'll attain salvation in this way through jewish rituals another person will say no i think i will guard you know attempt for salvation by serving the poor that's a broad path where everyone is following their own route 
the narrow route is very very narrow and very few enter because it involves having to believe in jesus alone submit to jesus alone so it's clearly talking only about people who are entering into salvation those the very very few people who are willing to submit to jesus believe in him and enter through him they are entering through the narrow road everyone else is just going down the broad path that uh, example is exclusively for salvation so a person who has now entered through the narrow path by placing their faith in jesus and genuinely repenting now that person has gone into a cycle of sin they keep sinning and they keep confessing they keep coming back again they go into sin but at least the conviction of the holy spirit is still working in their hearts they are still open to the work of the holy spirit they are still feeling convicted which is why they, there is a cycle going on they keep coming back because they're not able to just let go and walk away there is a cycle there but a point is reached where that person is no longer in a cycle and it's just one way they have turned their back on the cross they have turned their back on christ there's, there's this deep love for the world there's this deep um, desire for the things of the world and no longer do they want to come back they come back with empty words because they want to get into heaven they kneel down and they cry because they're desperate to get into heaven but inside there's no more desire to to follow the lord to submit to the lord or even be ashamed of who, what they have been doing so uh it there's no longer a cycle it's a one way road where they have turned their back permanently and they're headed away in their outward actions they may still be pretending to be christians but the one who knows the heart knows where they are at so a person who's caught in a cycle of sin they just have not learnt the beautiful lessons of an overcoming life if someone could explain that to them and know that there is hope they can come out of that cycle they can make a commitment and no live in the lord it's just that they have not understood those beautiful truths of the overcoming life uh, so that's why they're stuck in that cycle of you know sin and repentance sin and repentance but there are some people who um, they are, you know may actually no longer be in a cycle they have made their decision and now it's just a one way away 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 from the lord that probably is you know it's probably just a theoretical thing but who knows the warning about it is there in hebrews chapter 6 all right there are things that we could not cover uh, right now um but you know we will cover them in the next class because the next class is also talking about you know sanctification and redemption and uh, so maybe we can even talk about um, sozo and all of that uh, so we will accommodate all that we can you know in in our next session um just to very briefly you know in the two three minutes that are left if we can you know just quickly look at one or two scriptures um john chapter okay no okay let, let, if we can have um, how can you have a question when i'm trying to finish here okay go ahead yeah so uh so the um, the the question being asked over here um, yeah we are kind of out of time but you know the question asked over here was about uh, uh, people who are mentally challenged uh, how would they accept christ if they are not in a position to even understand the salvation message uh, so like we said uh, you know uh, uh, looking at uh, the chronicles passage and also looking at the romans passage uh, looking at the hebrews passage in all these things god takes the initiative of reaching out to people the holy spirit is working not only with people who have no mental challenges he is also working in the hearts of people who have mental challenges and he knows how to reach out to them anyone who is willing to respond to the working of the holy spirit inside them and begins to reach out to him at their own level 
yes they uh, the mentally challenged may not be able to think like us they may not be able to reason out like us but instinctively in fact it's easier for them they catch spiritual truths much more easily than us we have our mind and our reasoning and all these years of uh, you know a uh, hardened uh, you know uh, hearts uh, which needs to be broken through but for them uh, you know in, there are hundreds of testimonies where where where, where even as someone is telling them i don't know whether they actually understand everything that is being told but they catch the essence of what is said and for them it's so easy the spirit connects so easily with uh, the things you know which which god is uh, trying to reveal so in fact for the mentally challenged it's easier for them they have no mental blockages like us it is easier for them so that we we have to trust the lord and know that he reaches out to people he is the one who always initiates the salvation invitation the work of the holy spirit is not only going on with believers i mean with people who are not mentally challenged even with even those who are you know challenged in different ways the work of the holy spirit is going on anyone who is seeking him at their own level he will reach out to them it says in in, in the chronicles passage he will be found by them and in um, uh, hebrews 11 it says he will reward those who are seeking him so at whatever level they are responding to the work of the holy spirit the holy spirit will take care of it he leaves no one all sheep are very very valuable to him every single one so we can have that deep assurance but no harm in our ministry in asking the lord and saying lord you help me to share with this person in such a way that they will understand the lord will guide you the lord will tell you what examples to use he may in fact ask you to just sit in silence when next to that person and pray don't know how it will be but god will tell you what you need to do so yes it is always good for us to consult him when we are ministering to people uh, who are not you know in the main line uh, the, the way we are when it comes to mental challenges if we can close with prayer please because we are out of time lord we just thank you so much for the Uh, basic truths that we could see from your word today we pray oh lord that we would be sincere towards of your word we would present the salvation invitation correctly so that people understand that they are coming to jesus christ to have a relationship with him to submit to him to trust him to turn their backs completely on sin forevermore so we pray oh lord that we would be sincere in the way we present the gospel message and we pray oh lord that um, because now we are justified because now we have been regenerated we will value what we have and we will enjoy our union with you and we will continue to abide in you and strengthen our connection with you enable us not to be slack christians lazy christians who o oh lord are uh, forgetting the goal for which we came to salvation we came to salvation to be made like jesus so i pray that we will act actively pursue that we will actively work towards becoming more like you oh lord we pray that you would do all of these things in us thank you lord in jesus name amen